This course is about free will and how we, namely our brains and minds, make volitional choices. I have argued that it is the human imagination that is the true domain of human free will because in this domain of our own personal internal virtual reality, absolutely anything is possible. We're not held back by the laws of physics in here or any social norms whatsoever. In our imaginations, we can do, say, and think whatever we want. That is utter freedom. And since we can then go about creating in reality that which we previously had only imagined, we can translate the fantastic freedom of our minds into a freedom of actions in the world. If a person can imagine an airplane, for example, they can go and try to build it, as the Wright brothers did, and thereby change the world forever. And if a person can imagine carrying out the Holocaust, they can go and try to make that happen in the world as well, as Hitler did, thereby changing the world forever again. Thus, our imaginations are our greatest tool, and our imaginations are also our greatest weapon. When used for good, say in imagining how to make ourselves a better human being or in imagining how to build airplanes to foster international travel, our imaginations are the positive tool of our free will. But when used for evil, say in imagining how to kill as many innocent people as possible or in imagining how to build airplanes to bomb and kill people, our imaginations are the weapons of our free will. Each of us has to decide Will we use our imaginative powers to fashion a better future world and a better future self? Or will we use our imaginative powers to destroy our world, other minds, or even ourselves? Two or three thousand years ago, there were only a few ways to act immorally. So people said, God says don't do these few things. Don't kill your neighbor, don't hit on his wife, don't try to steal from him, and so on. But we live in a very different world now. Basically, technology and science have moved so incredibly fast that we are now capable of acts that are tantamount to being godlike ourselves. There are so many ways we might act in a morally questionable way, and yet there's so little guidance about what we should do given our technological powers. It would be pointless to say, for example, commandment number 654,321. God says thou shalt not raise embryos for their dopaminergic neurons for implantation into Parkinson's patients. Or commandment 8 million and 1. God says thou shalt not splice genes for the production of bioluminescent proteins from fireflies into tomatoes. No glow-in-the-dark tomatoes. These silly examples are meant to show the moral predicament we now find ourselves in. Our technological capabilities have grown much faster than our moral and institutional frameworks have grown to give us guidance about how we should use these new capabilities wisely to foster life rather than harm it. So the question we ask in this segment and the coming few segments is, Given that we have this powerful tool and weapon of free will, and given that we have nearly godlike technological powers now, what choices should we make? In order to talk about morality, it's necessary to talk about good and evil, because morality is fundamentally concerned with guidance towards choices that maximize good and minimize harm or evil. A few thousand years ago, when most people agreed on what was good and evil, people would commonly project these things out onto the world and say, good is out there. In fact, the word God and good are etymologically of the same root. They come from the same original word. God or good is up there and the evil is down there. But nowadays, things are not so simple. Many people, including myself, view the problems of good and evil not as being out there, as some sort of cosmic battle between an externalized good or God and externalized evil or devil, but as something internal to the human mind and heart that occurs even if there is no God or devil out there. Good and evil are no longer such monolithic notions. Back when everyone in a community had the same culture and values, and everyone pretty much agreed, it was easier to believe in a shared good being out there in an absolute sort of way. Now, in this age where we find ourselves surrounded by multiple value systems, which often conflict in their notions of what is good, many of us find it harder to believe in an absolute good that it resides out there. Rather than being an absolute good or absolute evil, we find that people can greatly differ in their opinions regarding what is good or not. Depending on the coordinate system we judge an event from, it may be meaningful or not. 
For one culture, the education of girls is obviously good, whereas for another, it's obviously not good. So we face one problem of modernity, which is the problem of moral relativism. How do we settle a matter if it might all just come down to a matter of differing culture or opinion? Is there a coordinate system for judging right and wrong that transcends differences of culture and opinion that would apply to all human thought and action? Surely there are different coordinate systems for assessing what is good. For example, relative to the exploding vacuum of space, which cannot care about anything, my children have no meaning and are not something of value. But relative to me, my children have great meaning and are of great value. Relative to me and that which I value, that which fosters the well-being of my children is good, and that which undermines or harms their well-being is not good. But again, relative to the exploding vacuum, there's no good or evil. Similarly, relative to human beings, that which affords the possibility of human existence is good and of value. Without the conditions that the earth affords us, such as having air, water, and food, we could not exist. So to us, these things are of great fundamental value and should be fostered and protected. So we can talk of a human coordinate system for the evaluation of what is good and valuable, even if, relative to the exploding vacuum, none of these things that we value can have value. That's okay because we are not the exploding vacuum, we're human beings. So it's natural that we assess the universe from the perspective of our own moral coordinate system. It's doubtful whether evil can be defined in the abstract in a manner free of any individual's frame of reference. Here, evil will be operationally defined relative to a subject's mind, to include that which harms or could harm that mind or that which that mind cares about. Good will be defined in a similar way to include that which benefits or could benefit a mind or that which that mind cares about. These definitions are not perfect. For example, one reasonably could argue that an act can only be good or evil if it is volitional or intended or at least the act of a conscious being. One could argue that only acts that have consequences are good or evil, or one could argue that thoughts and intentions, even in the absence of enactment, can be good or evil. However, no single conception can fully account for the numerous, often inconsistent ways that the terms good and evil are used. For present purposes, these definitions will suffice. In coming segments, our goal is to see whether it's possible to develop an understanding of how we should act, given that we have such tremendous imaginative and technological powers now. How should we act, given that we have free will?